reported. So be aware uh, at this time. And Paul, you should be unmuted. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Um, so today, uh, Cama Plan is going to present uh, Paul Moore, and we're going to be talking about multifamily uh, investing. Uh, I met Paul last spring at the uh, Mid-Atlantic Summit in Philadelphia. I found his thought process and knowledge uh, to be very impressive. Uh, and that's why I'm very glad that uh, Paul's here with us today. And I'm not sure if it's just because he was smart uh, or maybe it's because uh, we're similar in many ways. Paul graduated uh, from uh, Ohio State, a Buckeye, with an engineering degree. I also uh, graduated with an engineering degree. However, he went on uh, to get an MBA from Ohio State. Uh, then Paul started uh, management development with uh, Ford Motor Company in Detroit. Uh, and five years later, he started another company uh, staffing. He then sold it uh, to a publicly traded firm five years later. Pretty impressive at that point. And along the way, Paul was a finalist with Ernst & Young's Michigan Entrepreneur of the Year, two years straight. Uh, Again, like me, he entered the real estate sector. He completed uh, over 85 real estate investments and exits. He appeared on uh, HGTV special real estate episode. He rehabbed and managed rental properties. Again, same as me, he has a number of new homes, uh, developed waterfront subdivisions, started two online real estate marketing firms, uh, three successful developments including and in assisting with development of Hyatt Hotel and uh, multifamily housing project, which led him, uh, in my opinion, to be uh, one of the experts out there in this multifamily arena. On More on the personal side, uh, Paul is married with four children. Again, I had same, uh, not the same four kids, but I had four, <laughs> four children too. Uh, and one of the things I do know about that is uh, they love to spend time uh, with him, and he loves to spend time with, with them. It's one of his passions. Uh, Paul is also very active uh, helping others with his uh, time, treasure, and talent. And one of the ways I think he's helped people, too, is he's uh, an author of The uh, Perfect Investment, obviously by Paul Moore, and it talks about creating uh, wealth for multifamily housing. Uh, I think he did it back in 2016. <clears throat> uh, it's definitely worth a read. The guy, uh, This guide gives investors um, kind of a clear path to minimize risk and maximize returns, which I think everybody's uh, uh, in tune with, especially with commercial multifamily investing. And my dad got me started with the multifamily investing, uh, you know, 40 years ago. So Paul will provide us today with his insight and perspective, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to ask a few questions. If you're going to do that, please type them in the chat box. Uh, this will be recorded and posted uh, on our website, and uh, we'll make it available to Paul on his website. Uh, and that will be, um, you know, shortly after the, this presentation here. So um, I'm trying to change the slide here. Um, the our our legal department makes me start everything off with uh, one of these disclosures, and the views expressed by the speakers on the CAMA webinars are those of the speakers only and may not reflect those of CAMA, its members or employees. CAMA does not guarantee the accuracy of any information provided by the speakers. Professional advisors should be consulted before implementing any options presented. Uh, this isn't a selling presentation. This is uh, educational. CAMA absolutely does not endorse or recommend any individual organization or speaker. CAM, its members and employees do not accept liability for losses or damages arising from errors or omissions within reliance upon any uh, information provided by the speakers. Individuals are strongly encouraged by CAMA to conduct their own due diligence before making any investment choices. CAMA 
does not act nor offer the services of an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. We're, we're uh, basically self-directed IRA administrators. No tax or legal or accounting uh, uh, advice is provided. Uh, and we recommend you bring in the services of your competent professionals uh, if you're going to invest in anything. So, Paul, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks, Carl. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, change the uh, presentation over over to you. And at this point in time, if you can um, tell the people whatever I forgot to tell tell you about you and um, get on with uh, all the good information you're going to provide for us. Oh, my goodness. I'm already tired and you're just getting started. So, uh, man, if you think you're tired from reading my long bio, I tell you, I am too. And that was one of my problems, Carl, and that is that I spent a lot of time, even though I got an engineering degree and an MBA and went to Ford, I spent a lot of time swinging for the fences, looking for all kinds of different investment opportunities and chasing one thing after another. And I spent a good deal in my 30s and part of my 40s doing that till I realized that the most successful people dial in and they focus. And so... Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my history in swinging for the fences today. Uh, I'm also going to talk to you about the book, The Perfect Investment. Uh, I'm going to go way out on a limb with my cl claim that it, at this time in history, at this point in the U.S. economy, that multifamily is the perfect balance of risk and return for a lot of people's portfolios. I'm going to talk about the unexpected historic convergence of demographic trends and regular regulatory faux pas that have fueled the profitability of this asset class. I'm uh, going to talk about how multifamily investing compares to single family rentals, stocks, REITs, precious metals, and uh, other commercial asset classes, and how it has a self-buffering effect to uh, basically write itself in a down economy, which is what we saw in the last recession about 10 years ago. We keep saying a few years ago, but it's been a while now. Um, we're gonna also talk about the four ways that multifamily generates returns and the surprising tax benefits, which we won't spend as much time on since this is an IRA seminar. And last, I'm gonna talk about why multifamily is a win-win for everybody involved. So, you know, I called this book originally um, uh, the, the Definitive Guide to Multifamily Investing. And a friend of mine was finally honest with me. He said, you know, that's a really boring title. Why don't you call it something like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or, you know, uh, Think and Grow Rich. And he said, well, why don't you call it The Perfect Investment? Because that's what it really is. And this guy wasn't even a multifamily investor, but he had read the book. And I'll tell you, it, it is an arrogant claim to say that the book, I mean, that, you know, multifamily is the perfect investment. But I'm going to try to prove it to you on this webinar that it does have the right balance of risk, return, predictability, and stability. So talked about chasing shiny objects. Um, you know, I, I sold my company, like you mentioned, Carl, uh, when I was only 34 years old. And I kind of thought of myself as semi-retired investor. And, you know, it, it sounded like a good title, but I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Uh, going into semi-retirement sounds exciting, but it, it was boring. Uh, in fact, I was a high-energy entrepreneur, and I started in real estate investing before the word house flip was even a term uh, or a thing. And I tell you, I went back to school for about the next 17 years and I learned things I'd never learned and I'd never want to repeat. I mean, I, and I learned the truth about investing. Uh, I made a lot of money and I got to tell you, I lost a lot too. And that's one of the reasons I've got a podcast called How to Lose Money. It's at howtolosemoney.com. And um, it, this podcast, on this podcast, we interview people. And one of the common themes is people didn't know the difference between investing and speculating. You know, investing is when your money is generally safe and you've got a chance for a return. And speculating is when your money is at risk and you've got a chance for a return. And I speculate a lot of times. I mean, I mean, I made a lot of money. I can tell you how I made a couple hundred percent ROI on Google AdWords for real estate websites. 
Uh, I still have a real estate website. I sell leads to realtors today. Uh, made over $100,000 per lot flipping lots. I made a 55% ROI on a subdivision, but I could also get depressed telling you about the penny stocks that were poised to blow up. Well, they really blew up all right, let me tell you. Um, or the Charlotte entrepreneur back in 99 that promised 35% profits. Um, and he's like, I think he's on year 15 of his 153 year jail sentence. And he still won't tell the 2000 plus investors where he hid the $18 million. Uh, the, the waterfront home I built that should have made a $80,000 profit. And I lost $40,000 instead, but I did make more than I lost during those years. But it, a lot of these experiences drove me to look for something that was more stable, more predictable uh, tax efficient and guarded my time and efforts and multifamily for that, you know, multifamily became that for me. Um, so, uh Oh, my slides now. Okay. So Babe Ruth greatest home hit, run hitter of all time, or one of the greatest, but also the strikeout King. Right. And what I, what I was like him in this way that I was always swinging for the fences. And, you know, we hear those stories at our real estate investment clubs about the guy who, you know, bought a commercial, bought a lot, got it rezoned as commercial and sold it for four times what he paid for it a year later. And those are great stories. But the problem is a lot of those guys continue to try to hit it out of the park the rest of their life. And they're often not able to replicate that success. The, the problem is it's not a good long-term strategy. Swinging for the fences you know, a lot of the guys who do that are the really uber wealthy people we hear about, but a lot of them and probably a lot more are, you know, delivering pizzas now because they, you know, they might've had a great success and then they struck out. And if you keep playing double or nothing with your money, well, what do you do when you hit nothing? What do you have left to double? And that's the situation I found myself in multiple times through my thirties and even into my forties. There's a great, fallacy and it's the risk return trade-off it says that since low risk leads to low return finish the sentence right high risk leads to you would think high return but it's not true it's the potentially high return and of course when you see this graph and think through it you know that you know that it's potentially high return but it's also potentially high loss as well and that's what swinging for the fences often produces. And that's what I don't want to do anymore. And in fact, that's what multifamily has done for me and for my investors. And I tell my investors all the time, don't roll the dice with any money that you, uh, you know, that you have, that you want to live on and that you want to preserve. It's fine. If it's fine to speculate, as long as you know, you're speculating with a smaller percentage of your funds, you can speculate as much as you want actually, but I recommend that you don't speculate with any money. You wouldn't be alternative, alternatively okay with uh, using as kindling in your fireplace because often that's what happens. And so Paul Samuelson, the first Nobel Prize winner in economics in the U.S., said investing should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. And again, I'm making this point really heavily, but it's because um, I really want to drive home the fact that the risk return trade-off for multifamily and a few other asset classes uh, is much, much better than most investments. So I was 50 years old and Carl, I, I know I don't look a day over 40, you're probably thinking, right? But um I was 50 years old and I was uh, frustrated with a lot of the money losses I had had and a lot of the swing for the fences. And I was thinking, you know, I really don't want to be doing this kind of swing for the fence thing when I'm 60 or 70. And so I was looking for an asset that was predictable, that had economic trends that I could see into the future, demographic trends. Uh, I was looking for something that wasn't based on the latest uh, mood on Wall Street or the latest war in the Middle East uh, or fires in California. I was basically looking for something that was predictable and that I could pass on to my kids. And I think I found it. And so today I'm going to talk to you about 
investing in stabilized cash flowing multifamily uh, properties in great markets. So these are some real headlines I pulled out. And uh, the multifamily sector, whether for good or for bad, has just been going crazy. And it's just been an incredible boom for a lot of years, really, since the uh, middle of the recession, 2010 or so. It's just been straight up. And so what I want to do is talk about the demographic trends and the regulatory faux pas that have led to this situation. Now, the American government in its great wisdom in 1995 passed some laws that said that if any, anybody who could fog a mirror can get a loan. We all remember that. And when they did that, home ownership in America, which had traditionally been between about 62 and 65%, shot up to 69.2%. Now, in 2005, things began to crumble. And for the next decade to 2015, they slid from 69.2 down to a 48-year low of 63% uh, in that decade. And every percent drop meant a million new renters. The government had messed up. And of course, the mean bankers were blamed, and I'm sure that they had a part in it as well. Um, and we can prove that. But the point is, um, multifamily, uh, multifamily grew during this period. And at the same time, during those years of the recession, there was very little new multifamily being built. So the supply and demand got out of whack pretty significantly. Now, there are three major demographic trends that are driving uh, the uh, this increase in multifamily and decrease in home ownership. One is baby boomers. Baby boomers, a lot of us on this call, Carl and I included, you know, they're 77 million strong and baby boomers are the fastest growing group of um, a multifamily, uh, multi fastest growing group of multifamily tenants. Now they're the smallest group, but they're growing faster than any. And statistics say that when they rent, when we start renting, we never go back to home ownership on average again. Uh, and a lot of what happened, I think, is the last boom, uh, the, excuse me, the last bust taught us that the American, the American dream of home ownership, well, it wasn't necessarily our greatest investment like we thought. And so a lot of people got disenfranchised. And one group that got very disenfranchised was the millennials who were able to look at their parents, their uncles, their friends who lost their homes. And they said, none for me, thanks. Now, this group is the largest demographic group in American history. And while U.S. households have the newly formed households in America, have traditionally bought versus rented at a 65 to 35 ratio. Uh, new households in the millennial group are now owning versus renting at a, get this, 25 to 75% ratio, meaning 75% of new households are actually renting now. Now, millennials are largely disenfranchised with home ownership. They feel they have record student debt for one thing and record other debt. They don't have a tremendous penchant for saving. Uh, on average, there's, of course, exceptions to that. And um, they often don't see the point in being tied down to a contract on a seemingly overpriced home for 30 years when they might have new friends, new jobs, or new adventures across the city or across the country next year. And so um, they like access to public transportation. They like, uh, they don't like gridlock traffic. They like, you know, the environmental, um, uh, you know, the environmental, soundness of using buses rather or bikes, you know, often rather than cars. And, you know, apartments lend themselves to that more on average than a home in the suburbs. We're talking about demographic trends. There's baby boomers, there's millennials, and there's immigrants. U.S. immigration continues to play an increasing role in the demographic landscape of America. And U.S. immigrants rent more often than they own, and they rent for longer periods of time on average for a variety of reasons. So what I want to do is this is possibly the most important slide in this presentation. 
Multifamily offers the best risk adjusted returns of all asset classes. Now, this is a sharp ratio. The sharp ratio divides the return over a large number of years divided by the um, standard deviation of the price. In other words, the risk. So it's return divided by risk. Multifamily is uh, 4.6 times better than the Dow Jones, 1.3 times better than private equity, and it's better than any other commercial real estate asset class, except for self-storage, which is not listed here uh, as, a, as its own asset class. So the return versus risk is, to me, the number one reason that I wanted to get involved in this asset class. You know, so you may have heard that the serious delinquency rates, the foreclosure rates during the height of the recession were as high as 9 or 10%, and that's true for private banks. But Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae did a much, much better job underwriting their loans. They were much more organized, and their peak was only 4% during the recession. That's the peak of single family homes that uh, were in delinquency or went into foreclosure. Check it out though. Multifamily delinquency at its peak is that line along the bottom that looks like the X axis. It was only 0.4%. So it was 90% lower. And now it's 98% lower than single family. In fact, it's practically zero, which speaks to the power of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and underwriting their loans, it really does, for commercial multifamily, that is. And it also speaks to the stability of this asset class. Uh, multifamily does great during recessions. And this is one of the reasons. I met with a financial planner from Atlanta a few years ago when I was writing the book, and he said, if I could only find an asset that went up in good times and didn't go down much or even went up a little during bad times, that would be the perfect investment. Well, this slide right here is what convinced him that he wanted to invest in multifamily. You can see the incomes that rose from 1960 to around 2000. Uh, the real uh, incomes dropped from 2000 to 2014, where they flattened out a little. Look at rents. Rents continued to rise during that time. In fact, from 2000 to 2010, they rose a lot while incomes dropped. And I got to be honest, I don't think this is sustainable forever. But this is this and the sharp ratio is what sold me on multifamily. I was completely sold and I thought it's going to be huge. So did I say that right? OK, well, anyway, you get the idea. So I had to decide how I wanted to invest. Did I want to buy duplex? Did I want to buy? you know, a uh, fourplex. How did I want to invest in multifamily? Well, I came up with this recipe. And by the way, I had a great mentor uh, that uh, helped me through this. I spent a year with them at their, uh, they're, they're based in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, they coached me. They gave me all kinds of reading material. They were great. And um, I came up with this recipe. So passively investing in value add commercial multifamily with a trustworthy operator who utilizes a professional property management firm in a large and growing market, is one of the fastest, most profitable, safest, most profitable paths to multi-generational wealth available to the average investor today. So we're gonna talk about these. So commercial multifamily, there's, there is residential multifamily, which would be like a duplex up to a fourplex. Then there's small multifamily, it's kind of funny that they call it small. It's like five up to 70 or 80 units. Then there's commercial multifamily. Now, commercial multifamily has non-recourse debt, and it's large enough to have an on-site professional property manager. And that's what I love about it. Um, we want to invest in a large and growing market. Some of the reasons for that is we can have a choice of property management firms, and we can also have a lot of potential buyers when we go to sell. Um, because you can't change the location, right? Okay, Captain Obvious. Well, anyway, you've heard location, locate, and all that stuff. Well, that's really important. But another thing that's really important is a professional property manager. We believe that two thirds of the success of any multifamily investment is based on the location in a large and growing market and a professional property manager. 
So it's uh, pretty important to get those two things right. And most of the other things will follow. Trustworthy operator, this would be the investment manager, also known as the syndicator, the asset manager, the sponsor. Uh, that would be somebody who pulls together the debt, the equity, buys the property and manages, asset manages the property manager. It's very important to find a good one. An expert asset manager, that's about the same thing. Somebody who's not just going to be there at closing day, but going to be managing this for years to come. Stabilized properties. By the way, there's lots of ways to invest in multifamily or anything else. You can buy an unstabilized property. You can buy an empty building, you know, with 100 units. I have a friend doing that. But in my theme of low risk and, uh, you know, hitting singles and doubles rather than swinging for the fences, I chose to want to invest in stabilized properties. That means properties that already have, say, 85 to 95 percent uh, tenant occupancy, but they still have some meat on the bone or upside. And that's where value add comes in. A value add is a term that's thrown a lot around a lot. And I've never heard this definition, but I consider a value add uh, buying an asset that has a given known ROI, return on investment, and meaningfully improving some aspect or aspects of the property in a way that the ROI on the improvements is much higher than the ROI on average in general, bringing up the weighted average ROI of the whole project. Man, that was a mouthful. Let me say it's simpler. Value add is adding value to uh, and adding income to a property so that the value of the property goes up. Now, this is an apartment complex, townhome community we bought in uh, Lexington, Kentucky about a year ago. Nice missing shutter. That's a picture when we took when we bought the property. Hopefully that's fixed now. Uh, this is a property where we uh, one value add we did immediately was that had carpet, ugly carpet over hardwood floors, really nice hardwood floors. And so we removed a lot of the carpets, not all of them yet, uh, and we are able to charge more. Now the cost of removing the carpet and refinishing the hardwood floors is let's say $1,200. And if we can charge an additional $50 a month for that unit, that's 600 a year. So the ROI on that $1,200 to remove the carpet and do the hardwood is $600 divided into $1,200 cost or 50% annually. So if we bought this at a 7% cap rate, we just added to that. We just added to the ROI by, you know, meaningfully improving the rent in those units. Another thing that we did that was really fun is we added water and sewer meters to this property. And so the water meters actually measure the water usage and it allowed us to pass back the cost of water to the tenants. Now, something we did that was a little more important, I think, is this. We realized when we were doing due diligence that the cost of the water bill for this property was about 110% too high. What was going on? Well, we knew there was a lot of toilet flappers that were loose and things like that, but we also found out that the water level in the pool was dropping four to six inches every day. We asked the uh, maintenance guy from the former owner. He said, I don't know. We just fill it up every day, but um, not to make fun, but he just kept filling it up. They didn't re research it. We found out it was wasting thousands and thousands of gallons of water. So the cost of that was 65 or so thousand dollars to add water meters. And we're able to save about $60,000 a year. So the ROI on that's, you know, close to 95%. Well, every year we're putting that, you know, that's going to the bottom line, increasing the income. But more importantly with commercial properties, it's also increasing the value because the value of a commercial property is derived by the net operating income divided by the cap rate or the general rate of return in the market. And so the uh, value of multifamily and commercial multifamily is powerful compared to residential homes. Now we're all familiar with appraisals on residential homes. We get an appraisal and it's based on the other homes on the street. That's why you don't have the nicest, largest home on the street because you may be limited by the other homes. Not so with multifamily and not so with other commercial properties. It's the net operating income divided by the cap rate or the rate of return. So by finishing those hardwood floors and by adding the utility meters, we were able to increase the value of this $9 million apartment complex 
by approximately $1.3 million just by those changes. The cost of those changes was, you know, minimal in comparison. That's the power of investing in commercial properties and commercial multifamily. Now, this is, uh, we want to, I want to talk briefly about how returns are derived in multifamily and other commercial real estate. We call it CAPT for short, and it's a lot better than the old acronym, which was CAT-P. That's kind of gross, sorry. Oh, so anyway, moving on. Uh, CAPT is uh, an acronym for cash flow, appreciation, principal pay down, and tax benefits. Now, the cash flow typically on a uh, commercial multifamily property is somewhere to net to the investor uh, between, say, 5 and 8% a year, can be higher. And so that is, of course, the distributable cash flow net uh, from the operating income at the property. Appreciation, this is really powerful. Appreciation, like I said earlier, if you can increase uh, the income by, say, 10%, you're dividing now you're taking let's say a mil, let's say your income goes up by sixty thousand dollars in the example i used by the water meters well you divide that by the cap rate and your appreciation on the asset at the asset level let's say the cap rate is six percent in the area six and a half maybe divide the uh, sixty thousand dollars that you're saving by 0.065 which would be the cap rate and you get an increase in value from that simple change of about, I'm doing it in my head, $900,000, more or less. So $900,000 in appreciation to the asset, you think, wow, that's great. The investor's value just went up by, like, you know, our equity just went up by 12%. Not true. The asset went up in value by, say, 12%, but because of leverage, the equity went up by two to three times that. So that simple change for us increased the value, the theoretical value at least, of the property by say 30%. That's pretty powerful. And so there's lots of value add things like that that can be done. So that's C for cash flow, A for appreciation, P for principal pay down. Now I was really cynical at first. I thought, well, that's not part of the return. That's just paying down principal. Well, it really is. And you're probably ahead of me on this because it's money that was should have been profit, should have been flowing to the investors all along, but instead was being paid and essentially held in limbo by the bank because that money was paid to them uh, during the course of the um, during the course of the holding period. And so principal pay down typically starts after the interest only period at about two and a half percent. Uh, return per year, and then it rises as the uh, pr as principal is paid down more. It rises to a, up to about four percent. So that's adding to the return. You take the cash flow, the appreciation, and principal pay down. Add those together, and for a typical multifamily property, that would be the the total return would come in at something like twelve to eighteen percent annually. Now, you may be thinking that's low compared to what you've heard, and yeah, it is. Uh, historically, over the last many years since the uh, recession, uh, a lot of multifamily operators have had a lot better returns than that. And so, uh, but I think going forward, as tight as things are and as overheated as the market is, I think that's a reasonable range, say 12 to 15, maybe even up to 18%. Now, that's for stabilized, by the way. If you want to go to an unstabilized property, you may have a zero return for two or three years and then a very large return after that. Tax benefits, we're just going to hit very briefly since this is an IRA seminar. Uh, one thing we love is the fact that uh, directly investing with uh, the right kind of operator, it's not like investing in a stock of a company. You're actually getting the depreciation passed through directly to you, which is great. The return of capital, you know, return of capital is a tax benefit in the sense that if I refinance a property in year five and give the investors all their uh, capital back, all their equity back, and then they continue to have the same ownership percentage, well, that return they got is tax-free, just like refinancing your house. 
Uh, tax benefit number three is accelerated depreciation. We do cost segregation studies, which means that our properties have a study which massively accelerates the depreciation and uh, decreases the tax liability, usually makes it about zero or so the first five years, actually a negative number, and then it even carries over to up to six or seven years uh, as the property moves forward. So you get money in your bank account and a negative number on your K-1. Um, of course, investing through an IRA already has that built-in benefit and many of these other benefits already built in. So you're at the right place investing with CAMA plans already. Uh, number four, correctly classifying fully deductible repairs. You know, section, I believe it's section 179 just got dramatically expanded in the new tax law and allows people to write off a lot more um, of their expenses in the current year. Refinancing tax-free, we already talked about that earlier. Defer taxes through a 1031 exchange. You know, in the new tax law that came out December of 2017, the 1031 exchange was threatened to be uh, lost, and it was. It was eliminated for cars, trucks, airplanes, all kinds of things, but not for real estate. So another benefit for investing in real estate. Now, you may think it's time to die and pay taxes at some point, but... Uh, as many of you know, there is a capital reset at death. When somebody has um, assets in their portfolio, and let's say they're way down depreciated after doing 1031s and other things over the years, if the depreciation that uh, goes into that is reset, the value, I should say, is reset, and the heirs can actually pay no taxes on that, though if it would have been sold before the person passed away, there would have been a massive tax liability. Um, our favorite on this one, of course, is on this seminar is self-directed retirement fund options. And of course, self-directed IRAs, self-directed <clears throat> Roth and traditional IRAs are a great way to invest in multifamily and other uh, type commercial real estate opportunities. What's this baby here for? Um, I want to kind of wind this down by saying that um, I, I want to. I, I talked to a commercial real estate investor in Charlotte, North Carolina. I get a lot of trouble there, don't I? About three years ago, and he said, "Remember, don't ever spend a penny on your property if it doesn't directly impact." the bottom line. And you know, I thought about that and I thought, well, yeah, he's right. But later I realized, you know, I don't, I don't really believe that because there are, I mean, th these homes, multifamily apartments are places where people are having a life. And so my company, uh, we are trying to create caring communities. We're trying to create communities here, uh, you know, a place that where these People, these things called boxes uh, are actually uh, apartment units. And these units are actually homes, and these homes are linked together to become a community. And so these communities are, you know, places where, where babies are born. Uh, they're places where newlyweds celebrate. Uh, these homes are places where old, the older generation lives out their last years on earth. And, you know, honestly, Sometimes there are certain fences that need to be built and others that need to be torn down just because it's the right thing to do. And, you know, I could give you scores of documentation on why it's important to do these type of things and why you get more loyalty, better reviews, better profits. But I'm talking about something else here. I'm talking about just doing what's right. I mean, I'm called to love my neighbor. And these tenants, uh, these, uh, these people that dwell in our apartments are actually my neighbors. And so I want to partner with people who uh, think it's important to actually have this intangible thing called beauty and love. Uh, we're not just physical beings. And so I want to partner with people who see life through that same lens. And I, whatever your lens is, I would encourage you to find a syndicator or sponsor who sees life through that same lens as you. People who treat uh, employees, tenants, investors, and their money better than they treat their own. People who keep their word. People who, you know, again, share your values. 
One thing I love about multifamily is that everybody wins. You know, there's a lot of things out there where one side gets an unequal benefit to the other. I mean, I'm thinking of used car lots, but, you know, I'm not, hopefully it doesn't offend anybody. But, um, but in multifamily, at this time in history at least, everybody wins. The seller wins. I mean, they're, they're cleaning up big time right now as they're selling their properties. The broker wins. Yay for them. The investors win. Investors in multifamily have had very few losses and lots of gains. Um, and they, you know, a lot of multifamily investors even made money during the recession. Uh, the sponsor wins. Um, that would be the syndicator or the company, you know, putting the deal together, the asset manager. Our tenants win, as I just talked about. And our vendors and employees win. So everybody wins with multifamily. And that's one thing I love about it. We, uh, Wellings Capital, at that property I mentioned to you earlier, hey, we hey, have an- Paul, Yes. Can you, can you just take a minute because uh, one of the people's audio just died, and I don't know if it's just them or if it's the whole program. I can still hear you, so I think it might be uh, just an individual. Yeah. But if, uh, if anybody else uh, still can't hear, I guess this message isn't going to get to you. But if you can hear, would you mind putting into the chat that you can hear? All right. All right. And I guess go ahead on and I'll take a look at and see what's Okay, great. On. So I'm landing this plane right now anyway. So yeah. Well, <laughs> several people can hear just fine. So thanks okay, good. for the interruption. All right. No, it's great. So like I said, everybody wins. We at Richmond Commons, uh, our apartment in Lexington, Kentucky, we have an on-site uh, person who is there to kind of represent the company uh, and be a, kind of an alternative to the property manager. If somebody's having trouble with the property manager, they can talk to them. If somebody can't get their packages delivered because the office is closed at six o'clock when they come home from work, they can work with this guy. Uh, this guy organizes parties and movie nights and uh, backpacks for kids going back to school. Uh, all kinds of things. He is. He gets a free apartment there, and honestly, he's just there as a as an agent of goodwill and um, sort of a chaplain. You know, like the NFL teams have a chaplain or the military. Well, he's there on site for us doing that, and so we're. You know, that's not a big money maker to give him the apartment, but it's the right thing to do, and we are seeing a lot of people uh, who are a lot happier. And again, that's the kind of employees, that's the kind of situation we want. Um, Carl, you know, I talked before when you and I spoke about my big why. I'm not going to get into that a lot right now, but uh, Wellings Capital, I, we, we are passionate about everyone having a big why. And we think as an investor, as an entrepreneur, as an individual, it's a great to have a big why, something that you are shooting for, something that you want to make sure happens in your lifetime. And for us, we're fighting human trafficking and rescuing its victims. You know, if you took the record profits of Apple, GM, Nike, and Starbucks, added those together, double that number, that's the approximate revenue being generated in the world right now through human trafficking. It's slavery. It's a civil rights injustice. And we, you know, want, I feel very strongly about fighting this on my watch. And that's my big why. And I encourage everybody to have a big why, and maybe you can even find people to invest with who share your big why. So um, that's it. That's the overview of commercial multifamily real estate investing and uh, really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you today. And uh, Carl, I'll open up for questions. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions uh, coming in. One of them is... Um, Strategies have to change based on geopolitical, economic, and taxing environment. Uh, your book was in 2016, 2016. Has anything changed since then? And then they reference uh, state and local uh, taxes are no longer uh, deductible for uh, home ownership uh, after $10,000. Is that going to push more for people renting? Do you have any idea? You know, a lot of people felt that when, I don't know if you can see me now, I put myself on camera here. Um, I can. 
a lot of people felt that when the tax law changed to make a lot of the mortgages not deductible, a lot of that not deductible uh, in places like, you know, high dollar places like New York or California or other places, uh, it would drive more people who were on the fence into renting. I don't know if that's happened yet. I don't, I think it's too soon to see if the, you know, the statistics are out, but I think it's pretty likely that that is happening and will happen. Uh, the book is two years old, uh, but I don't know of anything else that's significantly changed except this. I think that there might be a little more uptick in millennials wanting to buy homes now uh, than we had thought before. And one of the reasons is that um, some of them, uh, that the home, excuse me, the mortgage requirements have been relaxed quite a bit in the last five years, allowing more people to, uh, to buy. And um, I think we saw that happen before, like I said, in 1995. So we'll see how this plays out. All right. Another question here is, um, do you buy and hold or sell sometime? And if so, when and why do you sell? Great question. So we got a 12-year mortgage from Freddie Mac on uh, the property in Lexington, for example. And so we're planning to hold it um, through the next cycle. Now, here's the reasoning behind that. A lot of people make a lot of money, especially when they catch a falling knife, like people were doing in 2008, 9, and even 10. And they were buying at deep discounts and able to flip and sell it for a huge profit in about two to three years. That's great. And that happened all the way through recently. That's not the time we're in right now. There's very few great deals in multifamily or any other commercial asset class. And so um, the benefit of holding long-term is that as interest rates rise, cap rates loosen, which means the prices can go, tend to go down. Inflation also tends to rise, meaning rents are going up, income at the property will go up. Well, guess what? When those shrink again, when the interest rates drop and when the cap rates tighten again, meaning the prices go up, typically the income doesn't go down with them. So if you can ride, be a longer term holder of multifamily or other commercial assets, you can actually enjoy the increased income and the increased profits that come with playing at this point in the cycle. And so that's our plan at this point. Well, as the um, mortgage rates increase, uh, are you know, a lot of times with multifamily, they, they, have them increasing in five to six years is yours more fixed or is it going to take advantage of what the rates were back in 16 before they started or just when they started raising rates again okay so um there are a lot of bridge loans out there especially for steep value adds or construction development projects and those are at risk because a lot of those are 85 percent loan to value and they have a floating interest rate and they have to refinance in two to three years. And a lot of those are coming up and there's gonna be some problems on the horizon, uh, especially if cap rates continue to, excuse me, if, if cap rates loosen, they're not really doing so yet, uh, and interest rates rise. Um, we got a low interest rate, I believe it's 4.4% fixed loan and that'll be that interest rate will be fixed for 12 years. And again, strategically, we're a little more conservative. We wanted to get a longer term hold, uh, if that makes sense at the time. Um, yeah, no, that makes sense. And I just, uh, um, you know, I'm sensitive, obviously, as many people are to the to the uh, interest rates that, uh, you know, the Fed keeps pushing up. But then they're also talking about that inversion. Um, we had another question here. Uh, you had mentioned uh, self-storage is better than multifamily. Um, is there a reason why you aren't investing there instead? Um, I think, uh, you know, for most cases, uh, people are investing in both. But um, yeah. one of the things I understand about, the, you know, I don't know if it's better than multifamily. I mean, it's easier sometimes because you have less interaction with uh tenants and their problems um mm -hmm. if you don't have a have a but um maybe we can do a presentation on uh 
on self storage because I do know that that you also know a lot about that if we can schedule one of those in the near future. Absolutely. I think what I meant to say was the sharp ratio was actually more favorable for self storage than multifamily. Uh, however, um, I love both. I really do and love to talk about that some other time as well. You're right. Okay, here's another one. Uh, let me, uh, it's a little harder for me. You, no, sorry, I screwed it up. Would you be willing to sponsor or willing to sponsor a deal? Uh, or would you be willing to mentor, um, uh, willing to sponsor a deal if it meets your criteria? Well, we would look, you know, we would look at anything. Uh, unfortunately, our criteria are because, again, all the partners of my company are older and we've been through ups and downs. We've lost money. So our criteria are really tight. But if someone wants to reach out to me at Wellings Capital, we can talk about that. I've got relationships all over the country with other sponsors and we would definitely try to find a home for it. Okay, and then another person asked, we just got started this year in multifamily commercial search, um, but have not done our first deal. Would you be willing to act as a mentor if the situation uh, yeah, uh, was, okay. was right? Okay. Um, and I'd say I, just have them contact you and you can talk yeah. to them. Yeah, have them contact me and we'll talk about it. It's not something that we've done officially, but we do know a lot of coaches and mentors in this space who are having incredible results. I just spoke at a conference in DC two weeks ago and uh, there were uh, there was a room full of people who were being mentored and they were thrilled. It was amazing. Okay, the other question... Um that I uh, had for you is um, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Well, they can uh, email us uh, info at wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S capital.com. Uh, or they can just go to our website and fill out a form. Uh, that's probably the best way. They can check us out at howtolosemoney.com on the podcast. And I'm also very involved in bigger pockets. Yep, great. Um, here's another question. Could you uh, review the pros and cons of using a 401k to invest in real estate relative to the loss of the favorable long-term capital gains uh, tax treatment uh, and depreciation benefits that it's available when investing outside of a 401k? <laughs> Carl, could you would you want to take a shot at that? <laughs> yeah, I can I can give that shot. But uh, yeah, basically, uh, I, I do a lot of my real estate investing in the Roth components of that, and no tax to me is uh, better than all the the tax benefits that's there. So uh, tax free income with you know, sure you lose the depreciation, but I tell people hold it for 10 or 15 or 20 years, don't pay any taxes on it. And if you really want to do depreciation, take it out and hold it personally after it depreciates. But if you're not paying any tax at all, um, I don't see how the uh, tax benefits of owning real estate help you. So I always look at the uh, what I'm putting my 401k or IRA money into what's the return of that and can I put it into anything else that's going to get me me better returns now do I have uh, property outside of the IRA sure because I didn't know about self-directed IRAs till uh, um, you know the the early 90s and I've been buying property since uh, since the uh, um, late 70s so there's obviously yeah. things that are there and I am a buy and hold light like you're talking about. So that's why I don't have a problem at all using 401k and IRA money for um, uh, there. Plus the tax laws have even changed. Whereas if you're making so much money, you don't get to take a lot of the um, deductions that are tied to real estate um, unless you, you know, have, lots of benefits and, and lots of losses in there until you sell on things. So right. the income stuff uh, uh, just is there. But, it, you know, I guess my main one is 
you don't want the general rules, go to your CPA and just ask them and then compare uh, investing with your IRA or 401k in real estate to investing in stocks, bonds, gold, REITs, uh, whatever else is out there and, and see what it is. But get professional help because everybody's circumstances are different. Like Paul said, uh, we're both in the baby boom generation and we'll pay for time and convenience because uh, we don't have as much time as, let's say, a 20 or 30 year old um, has on the horizon, right? We're uh, basically, you know, in the end of the third quarter, starting the fourth quarter, if we're, right. if we're yeah. uh, being optimistic. Yeah, absolutely. Carl, did you say I need professional help? Did I say you needed professional help? Yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody needs professional help, I think, in all of these. Okay, things. great. Um, but uh, the one of the other questions that I, that came in also is, um, uh, are you going to be at the next Mid Atlantic um, conference in October of this year? I don't, I don't even know if that's been formally. Uh, put out there, but I guess, uh, you know, I do know it is in October of 17th through the 19th, but, uh, okay. maybe, maybe one of the people know you or met you there. So, uh, okay. were you, were well, you planning uh, on being there again or not? I, I didn't know the dates yet, and, but I would love to be there either as an attendee or a speaker again. It would be great either way, Carl. Okay, great. Um, so that answers that. Um, again, can you give uh, wellingscapital.com is your website if they want to get in touch with you? Uh, you gave your email. Uh, is there a good phone number for them? Or? Yeah, uh, people can text or call me at my line, which is 540-400-1595. That's my cell. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Thanks, Carl. The next thing I want to say is we do have another uh, um, webinar scheduled with you on the 13th of December uh, in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I would um, uh, probably be at noontime and stay tuned because we'll be sending out um, emails for that. Uh, great. You got us uh, on here for that. So. Next webinar, December 13th, how IRA investors can turn $100,000 investment into a million through passive commercial real estate investing. And thanks a lot for um, thinking about us when you uh, put this webinar together. Um, and I encourage everybody to take a look at it and um, figure it out. And Paul, if you uh, have any any uh parting words of wisdom. I know if somebody wants to, they should get your book uh, um, to read. And what else would you suggest they do between now and the new year? You know, I would recommend that people take a really hard look at, you know, where they're speculating and where they're investing. And, you know, again, it's fine to do either, but uh, think really hard. How well do you know your syndicator? How well do you know the projects you're investing in? Uh, I think we're out of time, but I'll tell you in one sentence, we were about to invest three and a half million dollars on Monday in a project. On Tuesday, I hit the ground to do one final due diligence check and found some things that were completely unexpected. And we pulled the plug on the project yesterday. That was Wednesday. And we had to tell all of our investors, sorry, we're not going to do this. And I, you know, I'd rather do that then be sorry for five or 10 years to come. And so I'd recommend that you partner with people and invest in people in those type of situations. You know, do your own due diligence though. If you're going to invest a lot of money, try to get there yourself and see it in person. All right, Paul, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate your time. Uh, it was great chatting with you. Uh, we'll get this thing uh, up and uh, posted so that people who couldn't be here can see it. And again, uh, wish you a happy Thanksgiving. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Carl. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to all who are listening.